Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Friends of Liberty Republican Club evening program. We have the most beautiful young people in this auditorium, in this hall. They're magnificent, and wait till you see what they can do. So we are ready to begin. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. those beautiful young women. They're magnificent. From the Boulevard, from Olympic Heights High School. We always love when they come and celebrate America with us. And they've come again. Some of them have just begun to learn what it means a uh, color guard responsibility is. And you're doing great. And now they're rolling up the flag. Look how beautiful that is. And that, that's an entire activity. I'm telling you that you have to do it in a certain way. 
Now we have <laughs> we have two very important young women who are not here tonight, and for very good reasons. Heidi Martinez, uh, who is the director of voter registration in Palm Beach County, finally got to see her mother, who arrived from Cuba this morning, or actually was supposed to arrive from Cuba this morning. So it, the, of course, you know, the plane was delayed. So that's where Heidi is. Otherwise, she would have been a participant in our panel. But that happens to be the most important activity a, a daughter could possibly have. In fact, Heidi came to the United States from Cuba as a 17-year-old and managed, she had a sponsor, you know, <clears throat> that's the legal way, right? She had a sponsor, and uh, that sponsor was her stepfather, but other than that, she was on her own. And now, she's in charge of voter registration for Palm Beach County. <clears throat> Alexa is a daughter of Cuban immigrants, and uh, she has this gorgeous voice, and apologized because she had a job to do this today. She had to take pictures of Heidi greeting her mother. So you know, those are, those are irreplaceable in terms of the kind of um, wishes that we all had if we could greet our mothers or parents coming from a country, you know how difficult that place is for people. And we're gonna learn from those who are here this evening what that really means to live in a uh, communist environment and you will be riveted by their stories. They're magnificent stories, I've heard all of them. So I'm going to invite them right now to join me and I'm your moderator tonight. Um, Hannah Lannis, please. Sophia Analesco. And Ar Armando Diaz. By way of introduction, Hannah is from Russia. Sofia is from Romania. And Arlondo is from Venezuela. And we're going to hear an extraordinary story from each of them. And I know their stories because I had to make sure they were telling it the right way. They know, they, they know their stories and they know how to share their experience uh, to all of you. And it's an extraordinary experience. So let us begin. You you could do whatever you want. I, I'm I'm a you know very eclectic okay. in, in my approach to everything for those who know me. Uh, um, I'm going to begin with Hannah Lannis, and I do, oh, I'm, I, forgive me. Yeah, you know, I always go first. <laughs> you know, sometimes um, I already practiced it at home, so it's in here, and I will accede to your wishes. Okay, okay Sophia Manalesco. I have a question for all of you to respond to, <clears throat> and, and in about five minutes, tell us about one or two memories of the home that was your birth place, and what that experience in that place was for you. What was life like for you, Sophia? 
Well, um, I grew up in a communist country until I was 11 years old. So don't mind me if I stand. I do better when I'm standing. I have people say, well, do you remember what it was like? Because I was a child when we left. And of course I remember. I can hold it away. So of course I remember. I remember everything in vivid detail. Living in a communist country, you still know that there's a lot of lack because we were always on the lookout for the kids who had the blue jeans and the kids who had the Adidas. And whenever foreigners would come to Romania, they would bring little sticks of Wrigley's chewing gum and big pens and they would give them to the kids. And so that was our treasure because we knew that there was a world out there where you had things that were not, that we could not find in Romania. We couldn't find, for example, soap. We had to wash with this brown, stinky soap that you washed your hair with, and you washed your clothes with it, and you washed your dishes with it, and you washed your skin with it. And my father had in his closet a caressed soap that someone had sent us from the West. And it was all the way up in his closet, and once in a while, he would take it down, and we would smell it. And he wanted me to know that there was a world out there where you had such incredible luxuries as that beautiful pink caress soap that we had until it cracked and it stayed and it lived in my father's closet. So what it was like living in a communist dictatorship, you know, you had the empty shells. You had Ceausescu, the dictator's son, Niku Ceausescu, who could engage in the most atrocious behaviors. And of course, nobody ever condemned him. And of course, we have the fake news, propaganda, that were always telling us that everything was okay. So you see where I'm going, living in a communist country, I got to experience these things that we see coming to America now. We see them now in our everyday life. And uh, one of the most vivid memories that I have that, that was a little traumatic is after my mother left Romania in 77, she was an artist and she defected through Paris. She went with an art exhibit. And my father and I were left in Romania until she could get us out and it took a couple of years for us to be able to get our passports and flee. And when we finally did, we went to Canada, we went through France and we ended up in Canada. But in the meantime, during those two years, they tried to make an example of us. And between the bullying that I had to go through in school and what they did to my father is they, um, one day the Securitate came to our house and they started looking for incriminating evidence against my father. And they looked all through the house. They kind of did to my father what they did to Roger Stone here when CNN came and the FBI came. And they looked through everything. And they found $3.75 in coins that I was playing with. And they arrested my father for possession of foreign currency because it was illegal under Ceausescu to have foreign currency. So that's the kind of life that we lived in communism when we were not waiting in line to be able to get food or looking to find toilet paper, which is another thing that, you know, I don't know why toilet paper is always missing in communist countries, but that's one of the first things to go. Right, it's one of the first things to go. So don't even ask me the stash we have at home. My husband thinks I'm crazy. I'm like, you don't understand. You don't understand. You really want to have your toilet paper. Um, when finally they let us go in 79, they confiscated everything we had. We were allowed to leave Romania with two suitcases and we arrived in Canada. Somebody gave my father two Canadian dollars so he could buy me a Coke. So I know what it's like to start all the way, all the way from nothing, but we were free. And should I keep going with my Romanian memories? Romanian, one more. Yes, one more from Romania. Well, I grew up with a portrait of Ceausescu in the classroom. He was right there in the middle because they had to indoctrinate us on a daily basis. So I would go home and then my parents had to indoctrinate me because they were never members of the Communist Party. So being in school, you'd have Ceausescu portrait in the middle of the class and every book that we opened started with praise to Ceausescu and the Communist Party. And so you'd start to read. This book was published thanks to the benefactors from the Communist Party and thanks to Ceausescu's greatness. And that's how we have to start our day. We have to start our day swearing allegiance to the Communist Party and to Ceausescu and how great he was. And then in fifth grade, the portrait got upgraded from the black and white picture of him in his youth with his little curly hair to a colored picture. But it wasn't really a colored picture. It was the same black and white picture that they painted over it. So now I had to stare at Ceausescu with lipstick. Oh. <laughs> it was him, it was the same portrait, but someone had come and upgraded it, painting over it. And that's, that's just how, how, 
how poor and destitute that country had been because of communism. Thank you. And, and she will tell you a little later, toward the end, what she does. Oh, you know, can you tell that I was a teacher and used to yell in the gymnasium? Anyway, uh, and the lunchroom too. Um, Hannah, same question. Tell us in about five minutes your experience in the place where you were born. I was born in 1953, in April of 1953. You use this one. It was 35 days, 35 days after this evil empire lost the leader, uh, Joseph Stalin. And people will still was in the morning. I was born in a um, beautiful city, one of the most beautiful cities in the whole world, called Leningrad, what was named for another great communist leader, Lenin. Leningrad means city of Lenin. It means I already, just when I was born, I already was uh, very influenced by um, communist ideas. My birth certificate, uh, when I was born, the first line was my, my name. Second line was my parents' name, my mother's name, my father's name, our family name, and fifth line was, was nationality. My parents were born in Russia, my grandparents were born in Russia, and my great-grandparents were born in Russia. What do you think nationality would be in my birth certificate? Russian, right? You're very wrong. It was Jew. <laughs> My nationality was a Jew. <laughs> Only when I came to this country, people ask about my accent and nationality, and then they say, oh, you're Russian. I never, I was born <laughs> as a Jew. I left this evil empire, I was a Jew. And uh, this line in my birth certificate was like a line that I carry through through my school, through my childhood, through my school, because <clears throat> um, we have like um, like report, your grade report, and the end of this report it would list the nationality of the people, and I was the only one who was a Jew who of course was treated very, very differently than everybody else. I was very, um, very blessed to be born in the city of Leningrad. It is, um, it is the second largest city in Leningrad. And when I grew up, I was absolutely sure if people were allowed to move wherever they want to move, everybody would want to live in Leningrad. But in this birth certificate, when right away it was a stamp. And my stamp was said Leningrad. It means I was allowed to live in Leningrad. People who was born in a small villages in a small town, they were now not allowed to, to leave their places. And it was not it was illegal even change apartment from one to another. Even if, for example, for most people in Leningrad live in communal apartments. And what it means? It means five bedroom, one kitchen, one, one bathroom, and each room will be occupied by the family. Sometimes it will be three generations of people, and they all would share one room. To have a bigger apartment, sometimes you have to stay in line for 10, 10 years or sometimes more. Um, because of course, if you're not 
um, high-level Communist Party member, you will have a you will have a palace, and you will have a dacha if you, it is like summer house, and everything will be for you for free because of course it is communist country, right? Everything free. Your your education is free. Your health care is free. Your dacha is free, but not not to all. Just you have to belong to a certain class of people to have these privileges. Um, education is free, but for the rest of your life, you will be working for free because your salary will be $150 a month and it is engineering salary, it is doctor salary, it is lawyer salary, we all Approximately all of them would have the same salary. Depend what you want to do in life, you will choose your occupation. And um, um, of course, I was like a third generation who was born during communist era. And for me, it was it is only life what I knew. I had no idea how people live in different countries. At least some people in Romania have privilege to see <laughs> chewing gum or, or um, jeans. We even did have this privilege to go to Romania. You have to go to a special commission of the people and where it will be uh, like a row of communist people who will interrogate you to make sure you will come, come back <laughs> and, you, and you have somebody in Russia to come back. Um, this is, I mean, I have a lot of story to tell, and, but I think I will be better if you will ask me a question, I will be I, happy I to show you. I you to tell them what happened when your husband became um, ill. That, that is the, a poignant memory. The, the, this, is, this is a communist uh, system. Um, like I said, education is free, but you have to know somebody to know somebody to get somewhere. Um, healthcare is free too, but if you need x-ray, you will wait for six months to have it. Of course, if you will be still alive by this time, but you can find somebody who will take your money underneath of the table and you will come to this person and you say, do you know what? I know such and such person and he told me I can ask you for a um, favor and sleep envelope somewhere at home. And before you know, you will have x-ray done in three days instead of uh, six months. If you need to see a specialist, if you need to see if, like I was sharing the story, I was married to a man who was very, very ill, and he was needed to go to the hospital to see a specialist. We pay $6,000. It means it was like two years of my salary just for him to have a place in this free healthcare hospital. Um, and um, this is this is what we have everything. We have uh, childcare; it is free. But you know somebody who knows somebody who you can sleep with an envelope with money to get a place in childcare. You, if you, if you want to keep your tooth and not to pull out, you need to know the dentist who will know somebody who will take your money and leave on the table and they'll treat your tooth instead of the tower. Tell, tell them about. Microphone. Tell them about what happened when you went to university. <laughs> and <laughs> the story of the university, education is free, included uh, university education. You have to pass the test, you have to pass few tests to, to be admitted. And the person who had the most, uh, the most the points, the higher score, will admit to university. And uh, when, I was, when I was still in high school, 
I um, I was in, enrolled in the program when very elite university in Leningrad. But I, it was like correspondence. They, they sent me test, I feel it, I sent it back. They had no, I mean, they didn't see my birth certificate, they didn't see my passport, we just know my first name and the last name. And I got an invitation to, to come to this university. And everybody was telling me, you're a Jew. You don't know when this university do not accept the Jew. And I was like, sure, when, but I have an invitation. It is, for me, it will be different. I have an invitation. And I came <coughs> uh, to admission commission. And one time, the application, what I feel, was filled in blue ink. But the ink should be black. One time, my picture, what I brought, I look straight to the camera, but it has to be slightly angled. And the third time when I came, the lady from admission commission, she walked me to a corner, and, and she told me, look, you look like you're smart and intelligent girl, and you even wear a glasses. You don't see that this university don't accept Jews. You still didn't get it. <laughs> Because when I brought my birth certificate and my passport to admission commission, we could see my nationality. <laughs> and um, I, I went to university, but it was like a regular university, not like I was school. Thank you. And now, what she didn't tell you is she has a civil engineering degree. Two, two degrees from her, and we have an artist who's going to speak now. Hello. Uh, my name is Arnoldo Diaz. Uh, I'm from Venezuela. Yes, sir. Oh. I'm from Venezuela. Uh, my name is Arnoldo Diaz. Uh, I've been here, I have been here in the United States several times. I have a wonderful life in Venezuela. Uh, I've been blessed, you know, here too. And I listen the story of my friends here. Uh, I didn't, I understand that because right now Venezuela is maybe worse than that uh, with communists, but it's, you know. I came here uh, to visit my sister three years ago. And uh, I have three years that I haven't been in Venezuela uh, for the pandemic and things like that, you know, we stay here. But in these three years, the whole country is a concentration camp. All the social security for the old people, they give a one dollar monthly. People are starving, dying, you know, my friends, you know, they are very, very fat now, you know, it's very skinny. Uh, few people got a lot of money. They work with the government. Uh, they steal everything. I got friends that lose, uh, they confiscate their home, uh, their work. It's, uh, it's unbelievable that. Now I'm living here, you know, I, I still being artist, but I do some deliveries uh, with DoorDash, uh, you know, a few hours every day. And what I see here is, is people, you know, People don't believe that. We didn't believe it in Venezuela when some people came from Cuba or other communist uh, country and say they speak very uh, quietly. Uh, quietly. So we say, oh, no, you're in Venezuela, speak loudly. Venezuela is Venezuela, beautiful country, very prosperous. Uh, people is very nice, very friendly. And they, well, they, we didn't think that our country is going to be like it is now. We remotely we thought about that. Arnaldo, can you tell us can you tell us 
what life was like for you when you were there. You you had a wonderful life from what I understand. Can yes. You tell, I, us, tell us about that. I had a... Uh, I'm, come on. Like I said, I was, I am still blessed, you know. My friends, my family, uh, all my family is here. My, my two sons, my parents uh, died there. I couldn't see my mother die. Uh, I had some savings so I, I can help people there and I didn't pass all the necessities that you know most of the people in Venezuela uh, have uh, with the electricity that's sometimes eight hours four twelve you know daily that you know the electricity is gone uh, I've been there with so many march you know people protesting uh, so many friends uh, dying, you know, well, young people, you know, they always, you know, in front of the march. Uh, think that, you know, you never uh, think about that. Here, my experience here is that you don't think that that could be possible uh, um, things like that happen here. But uh, they do, we didn't too, but they know how to do it, you know, leader by leader, leader by leader, they, they divide society, they divide the families, their friends. With the, the pandemic, is like a ring for their fingers to them because they don't accept family or friends in your home. I, I see that when I take the food to uh, the home, the people is there, they shut my, the door in, in my face and say, put it there, out there, you know, it's, it's crazy, but not all the people, but you know, you, you, you see the fear that is inoculated in their minds, so they divide, that's the way they divide. You think the enemy is your, uh, the person who is in front of you. No other people, you know, your neighbor, uh, maybe your family. I don't know. It's, it's very, very sad. And you can't help people. People always do what they think have to do. Uh, in the, I was talking with uh, Sophia. Um, we are and the same uh, think, thinking about, you know, the individuality that it sounds like uh, uh, it's no good, but it's very good because individuality uh, permit that yourself, you help yourself and then you can help other people. When you are in a, always a group, it's nobody that look for you. I mean, uh, you can't look for anybody. You have to look for yourself. Then, when you are right, you can help other people. But uh, they attack person by person. They, you know what? Uh, that I, I feel here that uh, the fear is the, be the best enemy we have. You don't see it, you don't touch it, but it's in, in your uh, brains, you know. So we have to be careful because in here, like we were there in Venezuela, we think that everything is already right there, that it's for granted, you know, the liberty, the food, the work, the, um, the happiness, but no, you have to care about that. You have to look always uh, for that. Uh, it's, it's your your work. Well, uh, I still uh, very I feel very grateful with this country because uh, uh, it's free. But you know, 
we we need rules to live in society but sometimes so many rules they are taking you know little by little and you you lose your freedom and you don't know that you are uh, a free people He is a wonderful artist. He actually brought some samples of his artwork. And he has been to so many places, traveling to Spain, to other countries. And when he expressed the fact that having to leave his home, you had a beautiful home and yes. your gallery. And I, I, well, that's the bad thing that you, you have to left. Uh, you have to leave, leave, leave behind. your things. It's bad and good because uh, that's the lesson that uh, life gives it to you. You start every day because it's a new day. What you left behind is important, but it doesn't exist anymore. Right. All right, so. we're up to the second part. Okay, so we Thank have you. an artist and a woman who began, along with a colleague, a very important organization. But first you're gonna tell us what your adjustment as a young child, leaving Romania, obviously traveling to Paris, then Canada and the United States, what was that like for you? That's, that's a great question. Well, the first thing is I was numb. When we left Romania, I was numb. I, I had been so persecuted in school and they had picked on us and they were surveilling us. And like I said, my father was arrested for $3.75. We left with two suitcases. We couldn't take anything with us. So arriving, I, I remember when we arrived in Canada and we walked into Steinberg's, which was like the equivalent of, of what Publix would be here. And these doors opened, it was summertime. And I walked inside and this cool air conditioning hit. And I saw colors everywhere and chewing gum of every color and pineapples and bananas and Coca-Cola and, and plastic bags, right? My adjustment, there were no plastic bags in Romania. And I went to the produce bags, you know, those flimsy little bags. And I took a whole bunch of them and they were free. And I brought them with me home and I didn't know what to do with them. But I had all these plastic bags, right? And my eyes opened to this entire world of color and, and beauty, right? There was beauty in the little things that we never had in Romania. But it was a very um, sad and frustrating time because my adaptation going from Romania to the West was very, very hard. 11, 11, being 11 years old is a hard thing to do. And I felt even though in Romania we were persecuted and we, we had to deal with a lot of things, we still had, you know, furnitures and paintings and a status and my parents are professors and, you know, we, we had something. Arriving in Canada, we had nothing. We had to go to the Salvation Army. I had to buy, you know, the, you know, the, the clothes that I was wearing were second and third hand. Um, I, I had to adapt to a society where I really felt the lack and I vowed to myself that I would not be in that position where we would depend on the government, where we would take things that weren't ours. It motivated me. It gave me, it gave me a drive where I got, I put in my mind that I wanted the American dream. And even though I lived in Canada, tell them I'm not here. Even though I lived in Canada, I, I wanted the American dream because there's no such thing as Canadian dream. And I will tell you that it's bad in Canada now. It wasn't as bad when I grew up there, but it was still, I could feel the, the, the weight and the, the, the glass ceiling. You can't really dream that big in Canada. So I had big dreams. And my dream was to come to the United States of America. 
because here in the United States, the impossible is possible, it has been done before, and is being done every day around us. Even though we're going through some hard times, we live in a society where if you put your mind to something, you know, you start your little business, you stay at your business, you conduct honest business, you're going to succeed. You're going to start building and within a couple of years, your business is going to grow and you're going to have a little more money and then you're going to get a little more and you're going to grow a little more. That entrepreneurial mentality isn't found anywhere else in the world but in the United States of America, which is why I love this country so much. And so my, my journey was challenging. I was angry, but I was motivated and I was able to get to the United States of America and achieve the American dream. What was it like? What it was like to come here? Um, we came to this country. We flew to to St. Louis because my the sponsor, our sponsor was my uncle who lived in St. Louis. <laughs> we exit uh, our plane, and my uncle was waiting for us at the gate. I mean, I feel some kind of no nostalgic <laughs> memories of this country, how it used to be before. And uh, when we were leaving Russia, uh, we went through all kind of checkpoints, metal detectors, and I have a piece of luggage that have four corners, and they were metal four corners. They, they rip off my, my corners of my luggage because they were metal and they didn't know what it was made from. Of course, uh, unfortunately now, when I go to airport, you go for metal detector, you go through, I feel like I'm back in Russia. Um, they leaving the airport, my uncle, um, we got in my uncle car, and I see, it is a night, and I see two rivers, a river of red and a river of white. I never saw, so. I never saw, I was 36 years old. I live in the big, second largest city, Leningrad. We live in, my father was, uh, I was privileged to uh, have a very privileged life. My father was Navy engineer, and he had a car. And we have a high-rise apartments of uh, uh, 12 floor apartments. And we have, I think, four or five family had a car. And we're driving on highway and it is rivers of cars. Like every, I, I, it was very, very powerful. Uh, I mean, I see this image. And uh, next day we went to social security service because um, as a refugee, we were entitled, I think, four months of um, receiving some help. And I look at these poor people who dress in the jeans, what we always dream about, and they came to this office to receive, but they drive a car. They park their car and we walk in the <laughs> social security office to receive like whatever help they have. And I mean, whatever country it is, what it is called poor people. Um, my first experience with a grocery store in Russia, you go to the store, and if you're lucky enough, we have an apple, and you buy an apples. I walk here in the store, I, I never saw so many different kinds of apples in one place. I was like stunned, it was so stunning. And uh, my uncle told, told me that when you, I will check out, I have to look in the, on the top and it will be how many dollars I have to pay for my grocery. And I, and I look and I give a lady money and she, she asked me something. And I look again on the number and check the money what I gave her at this row. And she keep me, she's still asking me a question. I was ready to start to cry. And my uncle came to me, to my rescue, and he said, she asked you 
paper or plastic. Oh. And I was like, what? We, we even give you a choice. We pack your grocery. You don't have to carry it in your hands. And we give you even a choice. I was like, it was a very powerful experience. And of course, in Russia, if it's uh, June, you can buy some strawberry. If it's uh, um, August, maybe you buy a watermelon. I walk in the store and it was a strawberry and a watermelon and oranges, what we had like one month in, in January, we usually have um, oranges and they're all in the same time in the same store. Um, somebody wanted to invite me for dinner and they called me and they asked, what do what you have taste for? I said, what do you mean? I, I have taste for dinner. I said, yeah, but what do you have taste for? For me, it was such a foreign concept, but you can imagine what you want, and afterward go to the store and buy it. Because you, in Russia, you go to the store, you stay in line like a couple hours, and whatever we have, you buy it. If a chicken, a chicken, if a piece of something, you buy it. And after that, you have to figure out from one chicken how to make five different dishes and feed 10 people. But to have a taste for something and have a list, I mean, it was such a foreign concept. To have a list of grocery, just go and buy whatever you, you need for your dinner. It was very, very powerful experience. And then same, in this time, I thought that the best, what these people in this country can do for their children, they should send all high school kids to Russia without the dollars and let them live with the Russian family for the months. When they come back, it will be no more Democrats yeah. in this country. <laughs> tells me to do. You already identified some parts of your adjustment here. Is there something else you'd like to talk, uh, tell us about what it was like when you realized you couldn't go back to Venezuela? Well, uh, I can go back to Venezuela. <laughs> I, I can now uh, because I, I don't have the passport. It's, it's gone and you need to go to Mexico or maybe Canada to to renew it. I guess I asked it the wrong way. Do you want to go back to Venezuela? Well, I got friends there, yeah. uh, family. Uh, there are beautiful people, uh, but uh, right now I I don't feel like it because uh, it's no gas. I mean, you have to put to put the gas in your car. You have to wait maybe one day or hours you know so we can move you know i always travel by car and there but uh, now i sold my car well from here i i saw it. my cousin uh, i told him sold my car my bicycles because uh, i don't know when i go back again uh one thing that uh nothing is for sure Life is unexpected always. You, uh, and one thing that I try is to live the better I can every day because the only thing that we have is right now. So it uh, doesn't matter where you are. And you, you, can, you continue to do your artwork? Yes, yes, yes that I, I paint uh, almost every day. Paint always. I don't sell every day, but you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. That's it does beautiful work. I saw some of the examples. So I have one final question. Can I share just one more oh. story? I just, I just want to share with you, um, I think, a uh, good story about uh, my father was very 
Um, I mean, he was a Navy engineer, and we had a very privileged life. Uh, we'll put this way, we live probably like upper middle class life. And uh, um, the money was not a problem. But like I said, in Russia, it was certain stores and the certain restaurants and the certain places that was only for very special people. And uh, my, my, my parents was here in this country and uh, uh, it was time to celebrate my father 80 birthday. And we asked him what he would like to have for his 80 birthday. And he said, I want to go to Russia I want to go to Leningrad, and I want to go to this in, to this restaurant. Was not allow me to be. I mean, he would never walk in this restaurant with all his uh, privileges, with all his money. He was not allowed to this restaurant. And he said, "I want to celebrate my birthday in this restaurant." And all my family, we got together. We went to to Russia. Of course, Russia at this time has changed, and the only um, prerequisite to go to this restaurant was dollars, and we already had these dollars. And we celebrate my father's 80th birthday in the restaurant, but he walked by like year after year, and he was never allowed to get in. <laughs> he has to come to this country. You know, and she shared a story about uh, going on vacation. Now that her parents were allowed to go on vacation to a doctor, right? But never to bring the family. They weren't allowed. To resort. A resort. To resort. But they were never allowed to bring a family. And yet there was another family who was able to bring. It depended on and I see it as a caste system, you know, depending upon your level of privilege. That's the way you were able to function in that country. So finally. Just, just a second. But in this country, you're not allowed to have a group of people more than 10, but some people celebrate their birthday, right? And invite more than 10 people. All, 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 everything is closed, but if you're a special person, you can have your hair colored, right? Ah. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to ask a final question and then we don't, you know, it's late. I realize that we had a little bit of delay. Um, the final question is, what message would you like to share with our audience here about how you feel about everything that you've heard here now and what is happening in this country? Very good. Please um, well, tell us about Jexit. Some of them, yes. I was going to say, I'm, I'm uh, part of the Jexit group, which is Jews exiting the Democrat Party. Um, I am one of the founding members. Our, our founder, Michelle Terrace, and I met behind a supervisor of elections when they were trying to steal the election from DeSantis. And we started this group, and it, our group is growing. It's called Jexit, jexitusa.org, if you want to check out our website. And what we do is we educate Americans and you know, we educate the Jewish community about the recent rise of anti-Semitism on the left. We know anti-Semitism exists on the right. Um, it is incidental. It is systemic on the left. It is something that has become part of the government. It manifests itself as anti-Zionism, anti-Israel sentiment. We know that there's only 15, one, five, 15 million Jews in the world. Half of them live in Israel. If we are going to start listening to the anti-Israel rhetoric, then we are going towards a catastrophe, towards disaster. So Jewish people need to understand what's going on right now on the left. We're doing a lot of educational, we're doing seminars, we're doing rallies. We are also um, turning towards civil rights organizations. We are helping people who've been victims of anti-Semitism. We are the voice of those who don't have a voice. The people come to us. We went and we spoke at the, in Palm Beach um, at the, um, when, when we had the, uh, they were going to rehire the principal who denied the Holocaust at Spanish River. And we went and we spoke in Palm Beach. We were one, only two Jewish groups showed up. They called on everybody and all the other groups. They're all about taking the money 
and they don't want to jeopardize their status. So we were, it was us and the Zionists of America. We went there, we brought Holocaust survivors, and we spoke against them hiring the, I, I told them, I said that I felt I was in a twilight zone. The fact that I actually had to defend the existence of the Holocaust. So uh, we're, we're very vocal, we are growing right now. Uh, we met with people from the DeSantis campaign. We are going to be helping with the elections. And so what I want to say to people is, up until recently, most people did not know this, but we had a lot of very vacant, a lot of vacancies, vacant precinct um, seats. No committee women and no committee men sitting in the precincts. If you want to um, become a little more familiar with it, go to precinctstrategy.com. If you want to know how you can help, go to precinctstrategy.com. We had almost 2,000 precincts in Broward and over 900 precincts in Palm Beach County that were not filled. You get 1,000 registered Republicans per committee man and committee woman. You have to have a committee man and a committee woman, and they represent a thousand registered Republicans in their neighborhood. We had thousands of vacancies. That means hundreds of thousands of Republicans who did not have representation on the ground. And they wonder why they're losing in Palm Beach and in Broward. It makes you wonder why the people who are part of the establishment never did anything about it. So we are starting by the grassroots now. The Democrats have all their precincts covered. The Republicans don't. If you want to know what you can do, go to precinctstrategy.com, get involved. Get involved in your library board. You know, you don't want to be a precinct person. Okay, go to the library board. The Democrat Socialists of America are infiltrating from the smallest positions. And their favorite positions to infiltrate right now are the libraries. Why? Because that's where they control the message that's going out. That's where they're having drag queen hour. That, that comes from their organization. That's where they bring in drag queens to read to your children and your grandchildren. So if you have a little bit of time, see when your next election for the library board is. If you can get involved in your school board, get involved in the school board. Become vocal, go to the meetings. You are allowed as a citizen to go to the school board meetings. You need to take your neighborhoods back. Very, very important, don't be complacent, don't count on other people. It is up to you, because when we were counting on other people, we had over 900, now I think it's down to 500, because we're signing up people all the time, new people coming and being committee men and committee women. But very important that everyone gets involved and start doing their part, so we can take it back, we can take the country back through our neighborhoods from the bottom up. Thank you. committee woman. And uh, Alan, with Alan Schuster, where are you? Committee men from uh, Century Village, both of us are. So we've been working at it and, and we need all of you to help us. We really, really do. Uh, Marsha, do you want to close? Before she does, I want to recognize Dan Francis, who's here, he's going to say a few words very quickly because we're very late. And um, now, what you need to know is we have um, candidates running in. District 21, the Congressional District 21. It's an open seat for Republicans, but not for the Democrats. And there's a, um, a, a Congressional District 22, which is in the adjoining community. We will also have a local state house and state senate elections as well. And I'm looking at Cheryl Mullings, who is a secretary of the Palm Beach County Republican Party. Would you just, she's fabulous. She's the one who makes sure that our flyer gets into the wire, which is a Republican uh, uh, club or party that uh, uh, 
produces that for us, and we're very grateful, Cheryl. All right, very quickly. Thank you. Thank you for your stories tonight. Very powerful. And that's why I'm running for Congress. That's what they want to do to our country. That's what the radical left wants to do. Good people need to stand up and do something about it before it's too late. So my name is Dan Franzese. I'm a candidate for Congress in District 21. For those of you who don't know me, there's a lot of information about me on these cards that I left out on your seats. Tonight I'm going to talk for a couple minutes about inflation. Inflation is currently running at a 7.5% rate. That's a very bad thing. If you had $100 in the bank account last year, it's only worth $92.5 now. A year from now, it's going to be $85. And yes, I think it's going to be that bad for another year. This is something that I watch very carefully, and it's very bad for all of us, but it's especially bad for retired people who are on fixed incomes. So I've worked for 38 years in finance, so I study inflation, of course. In fact, I earned my MBA in finance from Wharton, the same school that President Trump went to. And, and because of my experience in working 38 years in finance, I saw this coming, I predicted it, and I know what to do about it. This was all caused by bad economic policy brought to us by the radical left. They gave us a perfect storm with four key parts. They clamped down on energy production in our own country and drove up prices. They gave us $8 trillion of deficit spending during the pandemic. They paid people to stay home and not work. And the fourth thing they did was they kept interest rates at unnaturally low levels. Well, the good news, the solution to this problem is very simple. Stop doing all those things. Start producing more energy here domestically. That'll bring down prices, but also make us less dependent on foreign oil. We need to stop the deficit spending. And yes, I'm a big believer in the balanced budget amendment. We need to stop paying people to stay home and not work. I think that's obvious. And four things we need to do is we need to allow interest rates to rise up naturally up to a point where people can start earning some interest on their savings. My background in finance makes me well qualified to see these problems, find the solutions, and get our country and our economy back on track to where it was before the radical left took over. So again, my name is Dan Franzese. I'm a candidate for Congress in District 21. I'm putting together a big group of volunteers. If there's anyone interested in getting involved in my campaign, please talk to me afterwards. And of course, if anyone's interested in donating, uh, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you, everybody, and God bless America. want to say one more thing before Marsha Kalecki, Stir Kalecki, I'm sorry, Marsha, we work so closely together all the time, Stern, um, we have the most beautiful young people across the street from us, by the way, in Olympic Heights High School, who are learning to be, uh, well, you could see what they're learning. They're learning all about the importance of patriotism. They're learning to use rifles. And I was asked if there was anything we could do to help them purchase new rifles. They are, um, the ones that they have aren't as uh, effective as the uh, ones that they would like to purchase. So if there's anyone interested in, in, in being a sponsor for the Olympic Heights, high school color guard, please let me know. They are very worthy. They, this is the third program they've come to to help us in celebrating America with what they do. And they are marvelous. So please, can we acknowledge that? And of course, uh, the, the club is going to acknowledge it in a, in a very special way. They're gonna get pizza in a few minutes. <laughs> so, um, uh, thank you all uh, this evening, and I'm turning this over to Marsha Stern, who is among many of our uh, audience are part of our planning committee, and, and go ahead. Oh, I was gonna let you close. Oh, I <laughs> Hi, everybody. Okay, I think these uh, panelists were extraordinary. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to try to make this real brief. Uh, so 
I just want to acknowledge the dedicated individuals responsible for creating this evening's wonderful event. And uh, I'm not going to name everybody. It's going to take too long. So uh, we call ourselves the Friends of Liberty Republican Club, which perfectly describes us. And uh, I just want to mention Alan Bergstein, who is the president of the Judeo-Christian Republican Club, knows what our Republican uh, mission must be. So, and I would like to thank our, our officers and our planning committee. Last but not least, to Fred Hadley, who, include, who includes our flyers in the uh, Village Century and also for live streaming tonight's program on Facebook. Thank you all. Thank you. And to all of you here this evening, help us to accomplish the mission of the Friends of Liberty Republican Club. We need you to join our club for, for, um, to fight for what we know is right. We need your energy, we need your input, and I think together, if we get enough people, we can really make a difference in Palm Beach County this year. And, um, okay, so when you leave here, uh, if you haven't joined our club, please do so. And there's a registration desk outside. And there's also, if you're not uh, registered to vote, you can register uh, at the next table. And um, so we all know that the upcoming 2022 election is critically important. We must reelect our governor, Ron DeSantis, and our Senator Marco Rubio. So, we look forward to you joining us for our monthly programs, which is the last Tuesday of each month. Our next event is Candidates Night on Tuesday, March 22nd, where we'll be able to hear from and meet candidates running for the critical congressional uh, districts 21 and 22. We're 21 here in Century Village and as well as our state house and senate candidates thank you all for coming and uh have good good week thank you thank you Marcia. thank you each and every one of you for coming this evening this panel was extraordinary please give them a round of applause they deserved it what they've gone through and where they are now and we have to warm up their pizza. Where's Russell? We don't, we don't, we have to warm it up in that, whatever it is we're warming up. Come, come into the library, children. Well, well I, I don't know that they're here. Uh, um, Elaine. Oh, gracias. Really beautiful work. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Look at this beautiful work he does. He's so talented. Elaine Adler, where are you? Sign up and get your information. Do we have a re any registration materials? Show the camera. You know what we'll take? Why, why not show back. yours? Go back. Put it on the camera. Thank you. Hold it on your chest. Hold it there, steady. Don't move. Anything else? It's okay. Okay. Let me see your face. Smile. All right. Thank you very much. That's yours. What's this? For me? Yes. Oh, thank you. We do that. A lot of work there. All right. Thank you. Let me just finish my video.